a welcome. And my name is Joseph Batesel. I'm the host for today's roundtable discussion. Our guest today is Stephen Odenthal, a humorist. And Steve is also a playwright and an author of several plays, humorous plays, a family merger, peach fuzz, melodrama, and a musical entitled Dorothy's Yellow Brick Adventure. He also is a featured humorist for the Box Elder Magazine, and he and James Beers, our other guests this afternoon, are working as co-sponsors for a anthology, a humorist anthology that we will talk about a little bit later in our discussion today. He lives in Brigham City, as I said, and is also a personal friend of mine. And Steve, let's just turn the time over to you. Okay. And we have a PowerPoint, and so go ahead and talk to us about being a humorist. Okay. Well, thank you for hosting, letting me come and talk a little bit, because it's one of those things that is... Uh, I enjoy writing humor, and I find writers uh, all the time who tell me, hey, it's hard to write humor. And I'm going, well, you know, what you do is hard, but what I do is just kind of fun. Um, it's not necessarily um, that... I don't have a serious voice or that they don't have a humorous voice, but it's what we work with. And so what we'd like to talk about today is basically how, you know, what makes someone a humorist? You want to hit the you bet. slide there? You know, is a degree necessary to be a humorist? I don't really think so. If so, I'm a great imposter, but uh, I'm having fun along the way doing it. And I know James Beers is also here today, and, and he and I are working on this anthology together, and we're discovering that other people out there have, have uh, a humorous voice and are enjoying it. Um, I know that uh, uh, James has a slightly different take on the world than I do, and that's what makes humorous fun and why you can have a lot of uh, voices out there. Um, some are yet to be discovered and that's what we're hoping for. No, you don't need a degree, no college education necessary or something on the wall. You can just do what you feel natural from the back row, from the front row, wherever you happen to be. You kind of comment on the world, you take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. I say you, you will agree that that taking writing classes and things like that in school and college do help you become a better writer overall. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Working within groups and getting critiques and talking to people, um, letting them see your work. That's sometimes the hardest part, but it's a necessary part. Um, and so is it a full-time thing that you do 100% of the time? No, I work three different jobs. None of them have the title of humorist in them, but it's something that is always in the back of my mind. Sometimes it, you have to be careful as you walk on the ground, not be inappropriate, but uh, funny things do occur in all parts of life. So basically a humorist, uh, you have to be very observant in life. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. <laughs> Does it pay well? Well, I'd have to turn my comment over to James because he's pretty aggressively taking on this uh, this humorous role as a young man, and I am on the other end of things, um, I can tell you that from my standpoint, I have not allowed myself the time to really invest in a humorous uh, uh, career, but it's there. James, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, it hasn't paid well yet for me, <laughs> uh, at least monetarily. I mean, it kind of pays off and, and laughs, obviously, but... <clears throat> Um, but it can. I mean, it, you can make money being a humorist, um, and that takes you know your a lot of effort in your marketing, and sometimes uh, not just in writing. You may not be just a humorist in writing, but a humorist in other avenues, whether it's you know uh, professional speaking or 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 acting or other things. So, but but so far hasn't paid me that well. <laughs> Probably. Well, Steve, we we know several uh, humorists that. Um, either were in the past very famous. Uh, Thurber, of course, mm -hmm. uh, most of us studied Thurber in school. Irma Bombeck uh, years ago was a humorist and made quite a bit of money writing books and uh, making personal appearances. So it, it is possible, but it's rare. It, it is. Just like any other 
writing pursuit. It takes commitment. It takes time. It takes effort. And a certain, perhaps a certain amount of luck of being in the right position at the right time. The only way to get there is to get your stuff out. Make your voice heard. Um, because a humorist really amuses him or herself. That's the goal. And if that humor is accepted universally, that's wonderful. Um, but you're out there usually finding humor in the ordinary. And in your retelling, you make it extraordinary. Oh, that's good. That's a good, good phrase to use as well. So finding the media that fits you, Steve. Okay, so what, what is out there that's available to us? Well, stage is something that I've really enjoyed writing for. I like the ability to, I've never been one to really want to be on the stage, um, but I like to produce the lines that get the laughs or take a serious subject and get uh, some thought provoking comment from those audience members. Nothing better than to hear your words come out from an actor under a director's hand and see the, uh, the effect it has on a, uh, an audience. I'm assuming next you're talking about screen or? S yes, on, on you know, the, uh, the visual screen, whether that's a television <clears throat> movie or now there's huge opportunity to, um, with all the uh, role playing games that are out there being uh, developed by the computer uh, gaming industry. There's a very big need for scripts and voice um, in in that er arena. And humor would play an important part humor, of that, obviously, in the writing. Especially in, say, say a gaming role, you have such seriousness. And, and yes, there's a lot of uh, the old shoot 'em up and, and, you know, stuff. And you can't have total tension. Um, you have to have something to break that. Comic relief is essential in television, movies, and, and gaming. The written word. Um, that encompasses a lot of things, you, you know, novel writers. You might think that, uh, hey, there's no room for uh, humor in a serious novel or a, a great romantic story or something, but you really need to feed your audience and give them something to take a little bit of a break and to catch their breath a little bit. And, and humor proves to be an essential part of, of building a novel. Often it's overlooked, but it's often... Uh, well, we'll talk about it a little later, my red shirt idea, but uh, um, story, short stories and articles are an ideal place to build a, uh, and craft your humor um, because it's a short time spent with the reader and it's pretty direct and you can try things. Obviously, you're not getting the instant feedback that you do on, on stage, but um, readership counts and you'll start hearing uh, positive or sometimes negative things. Um, from, as a direct result of your, your short story or article. Well, there's probably nothing more exciting, James and, and Steve, than when somebody either sends you an email or some kind of a text or sees you in person and says, hey, I read your story and I laughed so loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right? I mean, that's... Well, yeah, that's, 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 that's the payoff. That's, that's, that's the payoff. where your pay is. When they come and tell you about... Aunt Irma, who is just like Aunt Jenny, who was in this play or in this, you know, and they just go and tell you, they give you new material. Spoken word and performance. Um, there's a little bit of difference. Uh, not many humorists. Um, humorists, in my view, have always been more of the introverted type who are not looking for a spotlight. Um, but there are some. Uh, a good example is uh, uh, Stephen Wright, who makes observations on the world, and he does it in a rat-a-tat uh, manner so that, I mean, it, it's a small world, but I wouldn't want to paint it, you know, that kind of thing. It's a quick observation. It's a uh, funny observation, but it has depth. It has levels, and, uh, you know, so there is room for that. Um, I won't be on the stage soon um, in a solo comedian's role, but there are those that can take that humorous role and do exactly that. James, your microphone is making that uh, sound again, please. Really? Thanks. Much more opportunity here, Steve. 
Well, opportunities, they do knock, but they do knock lightly on the door. So you have to be kind of looking for them. Um, obviously, for a humorist, um, you kind of hone your craft in the back row or, or just a personal aside to someone making a comment. Teachers kind of hate humorists as they develop. But um, that's an important proving ground and a little bit of a, a, a test for you to see who you can make smile and sometimes it's it's kind of fun to uh to take a challenge it's not immediate you know you get someone who looks pretty stern and serious with the world and you can break through that that helps a humorous confidence it helps um lighten the world for that person too so it's it's kind of a an opportunity that you might easily walk by startup magazines such as uh, the, the box elder magazine that is uh, in its fourth edition now issue um and it's uh you know i i went in and talked to them and just basically said hey um i'm gonna get out of my comfort zone here a little bit uh, if you want people to be reading this magazine i think you need to have something they look forward to and often you can't control the news but you can sure control humor people will like a light spot in their life. You know, Steve, I think uh, what you and James are advocating is the fact that we need to be proactive. I know as an actor, an audiobook narrator, I have to contact, I have to make a lot of uh, networking with people. Sure. Otherwise, if I just sit here at my computer, people aren't going to just come to me and all of a sudden ask me to do audiobook narration. And I think it's the same with writing. You got to be proactive and go out and find the opportunities you're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with all the others, newspapers, local stage productions, commercial and web marketing, those are things that don't, don't naturally come to you. You have to take that step. Forward. Yeah. What would be local stage productions that well, maybe somebody listening today okay. could get involved? For example, um, a lot of the high schools uh, will have, will have a drama department that will, uh, and we encourage that. We love, love to see that. Um, but you have, staging of, of musicals and things that are um, maybe maybe you have a play in the in the wings that you'd like to have them do but you got to kind of prove yourself a little bit um, and so a typical example would be like I've, I've now written um, about 12 versions of the asides that are done and the theme of uh, the musical um, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat because sometimes they want to set it where uh, they are exploring the pyramids and they have different environments. Different environments, and there has to be some something going on on stage while some of these major changes are being made, and they need some uh, pattern, right. basically something said, some some little tiny scene that is acted out while things are going on behind the scenes. Right. Great example is that show. Right. There's a lot of shows that need something a little extra. And if you talk with the, the drama teacher, um, the uh, school itself, you know, you can get some opportunities to do some things. Maybe it's a helping with MC a, a program or something like that, or writing for, I mean, contributing jokes and, uh, and material is something that is, you know, you have to go look for it a little bit, but you'd be surprised how few people are out there looking for it. Well, I know speaking to our local drama teacher who I taught in high school, she was mentioning to me that they have categories where they go to competition. Mm -hmm. One of them is humorous reading or interpretation. And she's always looking for original material. Yeah. And that would be a great opportunity. It really is. And it's something that is easily overlooked, but you know, it, it's great. Right. You know, there's one other one other one that, uh, and maybe it's kind of under the television thing you were talking about earlier, but um, now you have YouTube is a great platform to uh, put your humor out there. Yes. I, I mean, still have to garner listeners or, you know, watchers, but, um, but it's a, a great platform and it's, you know, it's free. And you, you have done a, a pretty good job with uh, Q Monologue and, and some of the interviews he does. Uh, James has uh, quite a repertoire of, uh, of uh, characters that he uh, assumes and, and does uh, some, uh, what is it, uh, Totally Awesome or not Totally Awesome, it's uh, the, the awesome authors. Freaking awesome authors. 
uh, it's it's a, a good way for uh, a writer to get some exposure. It's a good way for for James to expose some of the humorous takes that he has. And yeah, YouTube's an excellent example. Okay, so um, creating your own opportunity. Um, the purpose of this slide is getting back to the the writer who says, "Ah, you know, I, humor's hard. I don't know how to get it, you know, expose that humorous voice." And and I give them an idea um, that I suggest that they create a red shirt. And by a red shirt, what do I what do I mean? Well. Those of you who are Star Trek fans from the old days, you know that if a crew member shows up on the Enterprise in a red shirt, his time is numbered. He's just got a short lifetime. Before the end of the episode, he's gone. I mean, even if you had stormtroopers on board, which would never happen in Star Trek and Star Wars, but they can't hit the broad side of the barn, red shirts would always die anyway. So it's, it's one of those things that is uh, easy for someone to do because if you have a character that you know I can introduce in this chapter and maybe he won't last the whole chapter but he can be a little comic relief and then you start using that uh, that character to develop your humorous voice he has no other purpose um, in this scene perhaps than to just be an experimental situation people will either be happy to see him die off or go, hey, I kind of miss that guy. You want to get to a point where, hey, I kind of miss that guy. Let's let him live another chapter. And then, you know, if you're doing that, then, um, and, and maybe in by the time the novel is edited, um, that character would have been cut out, but it's a good exercise for a writer. And so I encourage that strongly. In fact, I would say in your current work in progress for you writers out there, that's what I would encourage you to do is just start creating some red shirts and uh, then they can become major characters later on. Okay. Well, right, we're going to get to the crux of the we'll get to Utah the humor anthology. And Steve, I think this is to, to uh, really bring about what you and James have come up with is absolutely fabulous for potential writers that maybe sit by their computers, as you mentioned, or in school and uh, want to get involved in just writing humorous uh, pieces and having somewhere to submit them. So this is wonderful. Go ahead and talk about it. Okay. How this started was basically, um, I got a little bit tired um, of the sitcom jokes that you hear about Utah. And I, as a resident of Utah, and James also lives in Utah, um, I, I started thinking, you know, we're a little bit more than just uh, Green Jell-O and multiple wives, you know. I don't know anyone in the years I've been here, which is over 40 now, um, I've never met someone with multiple wives. And so uh, <laughs> that's one of the things that when I go traveling, um, I was in uh, Tennessee uh, a while ago, and you know, they said, "Are you from Utah?" And, yeah, I am. Well, you seem kind of normal, and I'm going, "Well, you know, there's normal people everywhere, and uh, you know, they they have a real curiosity about what goes on here." Utah has, perhaps, because of that uh, that stigma, that old uh, uh, you know cliche joke that you see in the sitcoms and you cringe for. Um, they, they, they want to know a little more and what's true and what's not and like that. And I always try to tell things in a humorous way. And so they get a kick out of it and they ask more and more questions. I, I think that those would be ideal readers and they, they probably would be uh, very interested in seeing how normal and then how not normal we are. And remember that we're trying to make the ordinary extraordinary. Sometimes that takes a little bit uh, steps off the path a little bit in humor and, and that, that can be encouraged and that should be encouraged. But I, we wanted to, to bring forth something that is uh, a little more modern view, a little more uh, understanding of, of the current culture in Utah than what is just easy, you know, easy fodder for a, a comedy writer. So we started to, to uh, 
start looking for a collect, you know, a short stories and prose that'll take us exactly that, Beyond Green Jello and Multiple Wives. So who can submit? Um, basically anyone. There is no charge to submit to this anthology. There is no reading fee. There is no editing fee. We will work with the stories that we get and we're excited about uh, the opportunity to perhaps even work with the Tourist Bureau um, and get some distribution out there to show, hey, Utah is actually in the same century with, with everybody else and we are a diverse people and we have diverse humor. Um, so we're anxious for not only what has been, but what can be in, in humor. Well, Steve, if you had a lot of people submit, are just you and James going to be the only people screening all of the material coming in, just the two of you? Right now, um, it is the two of us going through the preliminary uh, submissions. And we had uh, uh, just, ch we, we had a deadline of October 15th that we uh, had as our deadline. And just like any other contest, it's only in the last week the things start to come in um, in, in big bunches. Um, <coughs> but we've decided that uh, we need to extend it a little bit. Um, what we need to do, or what we intend to do, is take those that we have selected um, that feature Utah, talk about Utah things, resources, places, people, um, and make it you the stories that make Utah a, a positive feature in the telling um, and take those stories to get our a little bit of financial backing and stuff from those uh, uh, publishers and uh, third parties such as the tourist uh, Utah Tourist Bureau and things like that um, to actually help us get a natural distribution. Yes, we'll put it out on Amazon, it'll be available, um, but we kind of want to just have something, something that goes beyond just the bookshelf. We want uh, people talking about this book. Steve, you mentioned about anyone can submit. Do, are you having categories with, for example, if, if you had young people submitting like uh, high school, age students and then college age students or are you just throwing in one big pot right now we're we're looking for anything and everything it's the first effort to to do this um that we're aware of and uh we are looking to see where our sweet spot really is and that means we need to look at everything we're very excited to hear young voices we want to show diversity we're we're excited to hear old voices uh, do you have an age limit an age limit no no, um, okay. You know, and and that's the thing is we have not had the submissions from elementary school or things right. like that um, because we haven't really pushed in that way. But right. we we would judge each work on its merit and take into account where um, the skill level, yes, and yes. age, and all that. Because I, I think that it can be a great recruiting tool for. Um, businesses and companies that are looking at relocation to Utah. Okay, so what is the deadline? We had October 15th out there. That would be, well, we're recording, uh, re-recording this round table. And so that's just in a couple days, but um, we now have um, extended revised the it and extend it to the end of the year, December 31st of 2018. That will get us through the holidays and uh, plen you know, plenty of time for uh, those last ones to get in. You know, while you're talking about the holidays and seasons, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be a great opportunity for people to make observations and then write a very nice humorous piece, maybe during Thanksgiving or during Christmas, uh, that they could submit? Because that's, that's when a lot of wonderful things happen to people that are somewhat humorous. Yes, it's, it's wonderful things that do occur. It's also reminiscing with that family member that has that story. And so true. perhaps they, they don't feel comfortable writing it, but you know, if you're keeping your ears open and observant and like that, and you talk to them and make it your own, um, there's a lot of great material that could come out of the holidays. Um, it's one of those things that it, it, it's an opportunity that you know you need to to take advantage of all the opportunities you have 
to listen and hear. You know, it's always fun when you're telling a story that has, you know, is is you alone, but it's it's also interesting to hear a different perspective on that story. I, I have to give a a quick sure. story here. My mother, who passed away just a few months ago, I called her on her birthday, and she was just turning 95 at the time. And my mother is not very adept mm -hmm. to using technology. So my sister thought it would be good. She was at a care center. Thought it would be good if we did FaceTime together. And my mother hadn't seen me in years. I called her almost every week, but she hadn't seen me in a few years. So when we get on the FaceTime, immediately my mother saw me and I saw her. And she turned to my sister and just whispered. And she said, he looks so old. And I thought that was so ironic because mom's 95 or was 95. And I just thought that was so funny because she was being so honest mm -hmm. and she wasn't trying to be funny. And then my sister said, well, ma, you know, he's almost 70 years old. And she goes, yes, but he got really old. <laughs> and I think this is what we're talking about, Steve. Yeah, it, it's and uh, I, I think during the holidays, this is a great, and just be more observant. I yep. think you're right. Just be more observant. And that's where writing comes from. It really does. It becomes like a journal or a diary, and then it becomes a piece that you can actually submit. Don't you think, James, that's kind of what happens? We've lost James's audio. Oh, we lost your audio, James. Yep. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Is that better? Yep. Yeah, all of my... All of my Humor stories are based on, you know, experiences, um, and and they're just kind of normal things that happen, and it's it's just a perspective I take on, on telling them that makes them funny. Yeah, the perspective I like that. That's kind of what a comedian does. The yes. perspective on on life. Yes. Go ahead, Steve. Okay. Well, the important thing I think um, that we really want in this first anthology, especially, is we want to feature Utah as essentially a character or a, you know certainly a setting uh, for the storytelling. There are a lot of funny things that could happen in a lot of different places and there are funny things that uh, uh, are set in Utah. That, that doesn't mean that you know everything ha has to happen at, at, at Zion's Park or something like that but you know we want to stress the beauty and the, uh, uh, the positive things <coughs> of Utah so certainly if you know mentioning the city you're in or the the uh the mountains behind or the you know the red rock or whatever it is that uh is that or even just you know talking about unique businesses in utah or, or things so that the, you know um so we want that we want the focus of the environment of the piece to be about Utah, because about it's called U Utah Anthology. Right. Okay. Utah, that could also be in the, you know, in some cases it might be a Utah transplant into some other other place gotcha. talking about that culture that they miss or that they, you know, are trying to instill in this new place. Like a transplant that yeah. moved from yeah, a certain place to type. here. Sure. Very good. Sure. But, it, it, but we need to have that Utah tie and it needs to be strong. Right. And... James, you and Steve have read several pieces already. Just give us just a brief synopsis of things that you've already kind of received so people have an idea of what they should submit. Sure. We have uh, we have a story in there about <clears throat> sledding in uh, Providence Canyon. So it features, a, you know, a, a certain place in Utah. There's one about fishing um, on Bear Lake, which is... Uh, a major lake in northern Utah. Um, and then there's and there's some stories that are um, more about characters in Utah that maybe don't uh, feature so much as a, so much a place. But um, but like Steve, Steve said, we're looking for for stories that feature Utah, whether it's a, a community in Utah and its uniqueness. It doesn't have to be. We're not trying to uh, you know be negative about the community, but. I mean, there are some uniqueness, unique things about some of the communities in Utah that, that can be, you know, that, that can be humorous. Like I'm, re I'm writing a story for the uh, anthology about, about beekeeping and about, uh, 
how Utah has uh, has this uh, sub community of preppers. I don't know if that's the right word, but well, we like to be prepared for things, which is you know, which is a great thing. We're you know we're prepared and we're able to help out people who maybe aren't so prepared and you know during uh, natural disasters or whatever the case may be. And and so so my story is about beekeeping, but but it also features uh, Utah's. Uh, that sub community in Utah about about being prepared and and how we're always kind of looking out for each other. And I'm I'm assuming that you you don't want people mocking the culture or anything like that in your writing. Is that no, correct? I, I think there's plenty of other places that uh, seem to be freely able to print that kind of thing. Um, we're looking for positive things um, because. We feel pretty strongly that uh, a, a good laugh is a, is a positive thing, and uh, it uh, uh, can lift rather than bring down, and that's what we're really after is we're here, we're here by choice. We enjoy the Utah environment. Sure, there's going to be things that uh, you can poke a little fun at, and, and um, th there's some peculiar things. Those are part of the humor, um, but to be a, you know, we're not, we're not looking for any type of type of attack piece. There's other other venues for that kind of thing. Great, I'm glad you clarified that, Steve. You know, I'd like to, if I can just interject here really quick. So I noticed some things about some of the stories. <clears throat> um, you, you know, even though they, you know, they mentioned something about Utah, you know, just mentioning a place <clears throat> may not be enough to, to really get the idea across we're trying to you know, we're trying to promote stuff about Utah. So even though your story takes place in Utah, you know, can you can you drag it out and your drag this idea out in your story? That this is this is unique and and interesting and, and it's a great aspect of Utah. So you you know, if you say your stories, you know, it takes place in Brigham City or in Ogden where I live, it's not not really enough just to say it took place in Ogden, you know, because it could take because that story could take place anywhere. It could have been Ogden, or it could have been, you know, someplace in the Midwest. So when you when you trying to, when you're writing your story, your humorous story about Utah, make sure that it, you know it's it's accentuating something about Utah, whether whether it's place, but make sure that place, you know, plays prominently in the story. So we're trying to you know, we're not only trying to promote the humor. Well, we're also promoting humor in Utah. Thanks, James. I appreciate you clarifying that. Steve, go ahead and talk about these are submission guidelines, I'm assuming, submission guidelines. Well, yeah. Um, to, one of the things also that uh, someone new to, to writing humor may come across is they don't really know, know where their fit is for their boys. So you need to get to understand your own style and a comfortable length for you. Now in this uh, anthology, we're not restricting the length of the short stories. We're suggesting that, you know, about 2,500 words is probably about the top end, um, but we're also accepting poetry. We're accepting, you know, I mean, the cowboy poetry and things like that are, are big out here. Um, so we're not limiting what type of uh, genre you normally write in. You could tell a humorous uh, horror story, you know, if it could fit in the guidelines and stay relatively small to a short story. Um, and and if it has a humor in it and it, it is uh, applicable to Utah, it may very well find its way right into that uh, anthology. So um, understand what you're comfortable with and where your humorous voice takes you. Okay, next one. So, as, so yeah, I was just going to say then, uh, as far as the, uh, you said poetry, Steve, uh -huh. have there been any poetry submitted, James or Steve, any poetry as yes? Um, at, at this point, we have not seen a... a Would be great to have uh, some people interested in poetry. We, we, we welcome this. it, yeah. We All right, it, so. excellent. Yeah, that, would, that would be nice. I'd like to see that if we All right. get some poetry, yeah. Of course, the, the floodgates haven't ended yet, so you know we're we may well get some, but right. we we don't want to discourage any boys. Great. Um, and and getting back to right sizing your submissions and getting your submission right, you know, just like your natural pattern of speech, your own humor has a certain pace and delivery, 
And so, yeah, it might be a, a Stephen Wright ratatat type uh, delivery. Um, me, I, you know, it takes me 400 words to clear my throat. So, you know, I mean, it's it's a different pace that I have than obviously uh, someone who, you know, writes really crisp, uh, quick things. So well, it's almost like uh, stand-up comedians. They sure. all have a different style, right? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Good. So find your own voice and then uh, understand that not all word counts fit every humorist. Um, when I first went to provide uh, uh, humor columns for the, the uh, Box Elder magazine, um, they were relatively new to the publishing field and they're going, well, yeah, humor would be great. Um, maybe if you could uh you know write a, a story in you know 450 words you know um <laughs> and make it funny and just you know uh and someone might be able to do that but that wasn't a natural fit for me especially in the chimney fishing uh series where i try to tell a story much like patrick mcmanus would um for those of you who know uh, know a patrick uh, great humor writer um but you need to understand and learn. I did learn how to write a 450 word column. Most newspapers are, you know, six to 800 words or like that. So this was kind of- So a you have to be adaptable, you're saying. You have to be adaptable. And you probably also have to understand that uh, your voice needs to, to, it's still your voice, but it may be an altered version of your voice to hit those word counts. Like I said, our word counts uh, are, are up to 2,500. Um, if the story doesn't bog down and doesn't, uh, um, if it's it's you know longer than that, that might work perfectly too. Yeah, I think in our in our uh, submission guidelines, we kind of cap it at 3,000, but we make the suggestion that kind of the sweet spots around around 2,500. But we, we have had some we've had some um, entries that are maybe a little over 3,000 words, which which is which is fine. Which we'll look at them. You know, if they'll fit for us, we we would like to use them. But, but I like what Steve says because I think the sweet spot really is you know around twenty five hundred words. You know that that you may not be used to that writing your humor in that uh, long or that short of a, of a piece, but uh, give it a try, and uh, we'll work with you too in, in editing those pieces to to help them fit. And, and one of the things. Uh in in that suggestion is basically we would like to present you know around 20 to 25 offerings in this anthology as far as vo individual voices um and so if if everybody wrote a 3,000 word short story would have enough room we wouldn't have enough room for that so right now Stephen james when people submit are you asking for things to be can they go online and find out do things need double spaced or what kind of font to use and all of that? Do you have a place that they can look up that information? James, you want to? Yeah, if you go to uh, Utah Humor Anthology on uh, Facebook. So um, if you just go into Facebook and search Utah Humor Anthology, it'll take it to you, take you there. And the first post, which always stays at the top, um, if you if you if you go into that post, you can find the you can find the um, submission guidelines. They'll tell you all about formatting your your submissions. Um, and we'd we'd like to have them all you know all the submissions you know same same format double space. I think I said twelve point times font. Um, we, we'd like to see that. I mean, if, if it doesn't come in that way, it doesn't mean we're going to you know, like automatically kick you out. <laughs> but we would like to see it just for some consistency. Right. And the, the QR code we're showing on the, on the screen now, the Utah Humor Anthology uh, card that we use for some advertising. That QR code that you developed, James, uh, that takes you right to the landing page where the submissions are. Or, uh, the yeah. Are. Yeah, exactly. And you should be able to, with this PowerPoint, just go ahead with your smartphone and, and get right there through the QR code. So if people have any questions about the anthology, James and Steve, 
then there's information on there. Just uh, do they need to go on the Facebook and message you, or can they just email you? Is that on that information on the QR code? That's on the information in there. And, and yes, right. the answer Excellent. To, to both of that is yes. Uh, you know, the email and, and Facebook would work. Yes. All right. Yeah, our, our email address just just right off the top of my head is a uh, Utah Humor Anthology at Gmail dot com. So all one word: Utah Humor Anthology at yeah. gmail.com. It's, it's on that card there. So and that goes to both of you. All right. We'll see it, yeah. Right. Excellent. So um just some contemporary humorous that I enjoy. Um you need you need to because whenever you talk into someone, especially new, like a, approaching a magazine or a newspaper, they're gonna want to know, oh who you know, who are you like? You know, if you say you're funny, what kind of humor is it? So um, you know, it's often good to be well versed with uh, the different types of humorists out there and and uh, who you enjoy and and they're not necessarily going to recognize those those people as household names like you do you everyone tends to go down their own path in reading and enjoyment and so for me um i've got a few that i really enjoy Here, go ahead and hit the um one more yeah my particular favorites Patrick McManus, he, you know, he, he tells a story much like my grandfather did. So my whole chimney series, chimney fishing series of stories are, are not in Patrick's voice or in my voice, but very similar in pace uh, and, and timing to how Patrick McManus would tell a story. Could you uh, mention, Steve, quickly, uh, as far as maybe a title that people could look up for Patrick McManus? Oh, Patrick McManus, McManus uh, the first book I read of his was uh, Fine and Pleasant Misery. He writes a lot of outdoor stuff. He used to write for uh, Field and Stream magazine as their humorist. Um, and uh, you know, he was, a, he was a serious writer, and he actually uh, was an English professor at uh, Eastern Washington University and used to, you know, work so hard. He, he tells stories of uh, how he worked so hard and did so much research um, on, uh, and contributed to uh, scholarly magazines and, and uh, journals and got relatively little pay. And then he just had fun one day and just took off and sold it for you know that first story for more than what he uh, what he ever ever made on the uh, real literary pursuit. So that, wow. that kind of cured it for him. He just said, "Okay, I can make this stuff up." Right, you know, but and I think most of us is. right. Sorry, I think most of us are familiar with Mark Twain. Yeah, yeah, a great humorist. And um, matter of fact, and I'll put a plug in. In college, I did a one man show on Twain. It was kind of fun. But uh, a great humorist in his own right. What about Stephen Wright? Stephen Wright, I really enjoy because he can knock something off so quick, and he part of it is his deadpan delivery. He actually is a is a uh, stand up comedian. He's a stand up right. comedian, yeah. but he he's a, a very shy person and would prefer not to be on stage. He's said that many times. Wow! And just you know, but um, he has such a deadpan. Um, introverted delivery that it, it becomes uh, he becomes a character and robert kirby robert kirby is a local uh, in the salt lake tribune he often has has he, he writes from his own experience and he does things that uh, are a little bit non-standard with uh, uh the the general norm and and like that i get a kick out of, out of his writing um always fun to see that and wish he was in the paper more often Steve, you mentioned cartoonist. Do you want to you know, there's, talk there's, about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you don't really think about, or I didn't really think about uh, cartoonists as humorous, but they are uh, making comment on the world. They, they have their own back row that is safely tucked away, and somewhere in that magazine, in that newspaper, um, they have a little desk, and they go and they make their comment, and then they, you know, have their lunch and go home or whatever, but uh, you, we don't really know them by face, but they have something to say and they get it out there um, in a political cartoon or a, a, a featured uh, uh, cartoon in, in a newspaper. Steve, we're gonna wrap this up in a few minutes, but okay. you wanna reiterate some of these things that you've already talked about. So humor is all around us, you mentioned, and you said it's at weddings. Yeah. 
um, you're going to find any social gathering, whether it's a wedding, whether it's a funeral, whether, you know, it's... Well, you have a minute. Why don't you share what happened uh, just recently at, <laughs> at, a, at a funeral that you were basically sure. in but, charge of, I guess. Yeah, I, um, I had a uh, uh, beloved uncle who passed away. Um, he was getting a little older, and so it wasn't totally unexpected, but uh, uh, he had always been Uncle Bobby to me. And uh, about... Uh, six years ago he took me aside and uh, I'm no young guy and, and he was not a young guy and he says you know I'm I don't want you to call me Uncle Bobby anymore he says I, I'm Bob I'm old enough to be Bob I'm not Bobby but I don't call you Stevie and so you know I, I was feeling pretty bad and, I'm, and so since that time I've made very hard effort to at least when I'm with him refer to him as Uncle Bob and he was you know, a great example and a great man. We really enjoyed the time we spent with him. Um, and his actual full name in the obituary is Robert Anderson with a middle name that I knew was Robert E. Anderson. But I assumed he had been, I just always had assumed or been told that the E stood for Elmer, which was his father's name. And so I was asked to say, uh, a prayer uh, of remembrance uh, and, and dedication. Um, and I told my daughter as we were walking over there, um, you know, just re look at the obituary and make sure, you know, it's, it, are they saying Robert E. Anderson or are they saying Robert Elber? And she's going, well, no, they're saying Robert Eugene. And that threw me for a loop, Joe. I just was, all of a sudden, I had one thing to do and I had to do it right. <laughs> And so I went over there and I, in my mind, it was, I need to make sure I get Eugene. Not right. I can't slip. And I can't call him Uncle Bobby. I can't, I can't. It's not Bobby Eugene Anderson. And so I was sweating bullets a little bit on this because I just was over, you know, over cautious and overthinking. Right. Yeah. And so now there's, there were three uncles, my uncle Jim, who was the youngest uncle, formerly known as Bobby, who is now going to be called Robert. And there was Uncle Rodney, who was the oldest of the three. Now, Uncle Rodney is in California, wasn't able to make the trip. He's, he's ailing a little bit. And we were quite concerned about him, so I don't know if he was on my mind or not. But I offered the prayer and dedicated the ground to Rodney Eugene Anderson. <laughs> And I told my, after I made my apologies to everyone, because I didn't know I did it. And afterwards, my wife came up and said, oh, my goodness, you did that. And so I had to go and talk to everyone in the family and just say, oh, I, was, I was so concerned about getting Eugene right. And then they thought that was funny. I, I thought it was quite, uh, I didn't see the humor in it. But the further away I get, I see the humor. Well, I think that's the key, Steve. The further away we get, there's humor in so many things in life. And uh, that's what makes life multi-dimensional for all of us. It We're is. not one-dimensional people. We're multi-dimensional, which makes characters exciting because sure. they have sense of humor. Really, really uh, a great, great story you shared. Thank you. Vacations, of course. Vacations are these are just a a trove. different ways of people gathering the information to be a humorous writer. That's right. Holidays are coming up. And sometimes it just takes a humorous eye to see the funny. You have to get a little distance sometimes. I need to call my Uncle Rodney and tell him that I just dedicated a piece of ground for him and he needs to get over here. But I'm not going to hurry him along because we love him dearly. But. <laughs> Great idea. So you want to remember to keep your voice in humor writing. It, 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 I, it just would not work for me to be attempting to be Stephen Wright. Gotcha. Um, you have to be genuine. You can't fake the humorous tales you tell. You can exaggerate. That's kind of fun. There's James, a big you, difference, though, isn't there? There Steve? is. There is. James, wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's there's sometimes where you, you, just, you have to keep that voice. Otherwise, you know, even though it may seem funny to you, if you... If you lose that voice, you know, it kind of falls flat. <laughs>
Well, there, there, there's a remarkable difference of making something up that's uh, factual and making it fiction just to be funny versus a real experience is what you're saying. Certainly. Like you could have made up that story, but that really happened to you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you have to, you can't take the heart out of your stories. Right. Okay, and then another thing that's important is don't let others deter your voice. It's your story. It's your way of telling it. And it's very precious as any writer knows. There are lots of people who can take your premise and move a different way with it. But Well, that's they, one thing I think that you and James are trying to encourage people. It's your voice. It's your story. And just because Aunt Jane read it and she's a writer and she wants to change it, make sure you keep your voice. Right. Oh, Absolutely. Good. And so another go. thing I'd encourage all humor writers to do is submit to a good anthology. And there's just one that we've talked about today that might just be the right place for you to submit. So think about it. And enjoy that fame and fortune like James and I are. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a champagne life and we're living it to the fullest. So, <laughs> Well, listen, we want to thank Stephen Odenthal, James Beers for again, coming on today and sharing all of this information about being a humorist and more importantly about the anthology which is going to be now a deadline after December that we want to encourage people to submit and we hope that we will get lots of submissions Steve and James and that this will be we hope a yearly type of thing. Yeah, so it would be do. great if we could do it on a yearly basis. This will be our proving ground and see where where our traction is and, and we'll go from there. But please do submit. Um, everyone has something that they can contribute, I'm sure. And humor is just a fun pursuit. And you never know unless you try. That's right. Well, we want to thank Steve and, and James for joining us today. And I appreciate the fact of the people that are sharing all of these round tables and joining our discussions. And on the 20th, we will have the pleasure of our next presenter, Jeff Chamberlain, a professional screenwriter. Please don't miss that. Thank you very much and have a very wonderful day. Thank you.